Thanks, Stan. Um, I'm trying, as it says on the screen, this is an experiment. Um, I've been collecting old pictures of Portsmouth for a long time, and, and I don't have them all yet. But I do have about 1,400 of them. And so what I decided to do for this presentation was to show you some of those pictures and then also go out and take the same scene today. Uh, I was, in addition to being a history teacher, I was a professional photographer. I shouldn't say that before you see these pictures. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, so that's, that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to... I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the old ones to explain them a little bit, and then I'm going to flash the, the new ones, because I have about 55 slides, so we want to really get through this in a reasonable time. So uh, it is an experiment because I, I can do this again on, you know, at another time. It's a easy, fairly easy thing to put together with my computer skills. And, um, but anyway, just to give you an idea of what Portsmouth used to look like and what it looks like today. So we'll start with that. OK, old photographs are treasures. This is the Portsmouth coal mine. We did have a coal mine in Portsmouth. Some of you might not know that. And it was just to write about where the Carnegie Abbey Tower, Carnegie Abbey Tower is at Arnold's Point. And this is part of it. Part of it was under construction. It was there from um, 18.9 until 1913, off and on. Uh, it was anthracite coal, which is a hard coal. It's hard to ignite, and it's hard to, uh, it burns hot. So it wasn't adaptable for, for family furnaces. Uh, it was good for industrial uses, and we had a copper works next to it in the 1860s that uh, used the, co the coal. They eventually went into the briquette making business, um, and that's, that was, but the, the closing up was kind of interesting. There were two owners. One of whom was the governor of Massachusetts, a man by the name of Louis Foss. And he had a partner. And, and he was running for re-election in 1912. And his partner refused to endorse him. So he <laughs> bailed out of the coal mine and it went out of business. So. But that's where it was. And this is where it was. If you stand at the scenic overlook on uh, Lehigh Hill and look toward the, I tried to keep the Carnegie Tower out of it. It's just right on the right corner there. Uh, but that's where it was. Back in, back in the day. Cogshill School was being built in 1926 when this photograph was taken. Uh, there's a wonderful truck on the right-hand side there. You, can, you hope you can see it, OK? It's pretty dark. But the Cogshill School, which obviously is in the news these days because they're looking for further uses of it. That's what it looks like today, or part of it. I couldn't quite get all of it into the, the photograph. The entrance gates to Sandy Point Farm. Reginald Vanderbilt uh, established Sandy Point Farm in 1902. And he had the gates were built, and they were on the corner of uh, Wapping Road and uh, Sandy Point Avenue. You can't see it very clearly, probably, in the slide, but uh, my pointer here. On the right-hand side, right, right in this area, it says Sandy Point Farm. And uh, the gates went in. To this area, which they probably couldn't today because it's kind of a swamp behind the gates, but here's what they look like today. They're still there, and you still can barely read the Sandy Point Farm sign on the right, and then you have the keep out sign on the left. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Again, at least the, sta the, the gates were preserved, and Reginald Vanderbilt lived at that farm from, uh, they lived there a lot, uh, between 1902 and 1925 when he died. Uh, soon after having a daughter by the name of Gloria Vanderbilt, and a, later a grandson named Anderson Cooper. Um, and, uh, but Reggie, um, according to one diarist in Portsmouth, her entry in her diary was, Reginald Vanderbilt died today, drank himself to death. And that's absolutely the truth. I've written books on Sandy Point Farm, and uh, I could verify that. Anyway, that's what it looks like now. The trolley, somehow the photographer got the trolley operator to stop the trolley, get out in the middle of a snowstorm, <laughs> and uh, have his picture taken. The trolleys ran out the two main roads, the east main road and the west main road. And uh, this is the east main road. And the scene today, if you can, I, this took a little reconstructing. Uh, the scene today is right at the entrance of the 70 sports complex. I can go back and you can see. That's right where that is. And if the, you actually can see in this postcard, it's a postcard from about 1908, 
And you can actually can see the, the turn in the road beyond Oakland Farm, where it turns down toward Coxville School that way. And that shows up. This postcard was taken by a photographer by the name of O.E. Du Bois. Some of you have heard me talk about him before. He was a Fall River photo itinerant photographer who went all over the Saconet area and took photographs between roughly 1908 and 1913. And we, we are so lucky to have him had done that. He does street scenes. He, oh, you'll see a bunch of his uh, in this presentation. And it's just wonderful. He just did a great job of photographing the local area. I did a book on him in 1983 when I had 60 of his postcards. I said, how could there be many more? I have 640 now. <laughs> so he really was very prolific in his work. Uh, on the right in this picture is uh, Oakland Farm, which was owned by Alfred Gwynne Vanderbilt, who uh, established that in 1904. And he, unfortunately, going to a uh, coaching exhibit in England, happened to sail on the Lusitania in 1914. And uh, the ship was torpedoed off Ireland, and he, was, uh, he could not swim. But according to a deposition that I found in his records, he, uh, he took off his life jacket and gave it to a woman. And he died, and was, his body was never recovered. And he left a fortune. You, can't, you, can't, you can do this, or actually you can do that on the computer. He left a fortune of about $30 million, which is probably a fortune of about five, six hundred million dollars today. He was a very wealthy man, much better off than his brother, uh, Reggie, who had Sandy Point. So that's the scene today. The Leonard Brown house in the Glen. Leonard Brown was a farmer in the 1860s, and Leonard Brown's farm was virtually all the 70s sports complex, and all the way down into the polo field, that, that far down. The house was right there on the road where you make the sharp turn. It's still there. And we are very fortunate in the fact that it has been restored and is used as a town base for the recreation program. This photograph was taken in 1920. A fellow from uh, Portsmouth gave me this photograph and about 10 other ones. They're really tiny photographs, but they show his family. Uh, it was a, uh, a family that ran the farm in the 1920s. And they, uh, it, pictures of the, the cows and, and the mother and the milking area and so on. That whole area was one farm. And of course, that's it today. You know, we've seen that. That's a, a really great restoration of, of a, uh, an old building. We're lucky to have that. The town hall was completed in 1908, uh, 1895 at a cost of $5,000. They probably thought it was, was too expensive. One of the things about the town hall in those days, though, and this is a Du Bois postcard, by the way, because the name is typed on here. You can see it. Uh, and he did that on a lot of his postcards. But in any case, what you see over here is the vault, <clears throat> which is now the vault in the town clerk's office. It was a separate building. <coughs> if they wanted something out of the vault, they had to go outside and, and go into it. Eventually, they incorporated it into the, the building itself. But again, it doesn't look too much different today. This is another view of it in the, uh, in the 20s, I think it was, from, from the car. That's about probably when it was. And here you can see the vault separate out here on the, beyond the building. I think they could have used a coat of paint about that time. Anyway, oh, this was, this was after 1921. And there, of course, you see a telephone pole in the middle. And that's what it looks like today. I apologize for the sunstroke, but the sun was in the wrong place. Anyway, Quaker Hill School was built in 1914. We had a lot of, uh, we called them one room schoolhouses. They weren't all one room schoolhouses. Uh, there's, um, there's only one left, and it's been converted into a house. It's on Brayman's Lane, and, uh, um, but it is a house. But the others have all vanished one time or another. I, I can say the Historical Society was given one in 1939 uh, over on uh, the other end of Union Street, but it was in pretty bad shape and it eventually disintegrated. And another one, um, they, they were used, one was used by the Public Works Department, was on uh, Schoolhouse Lane, 
aptly named. Uh, and it, it was just torn down maybe about 10, 15 years ago. But you can see there, there are different entrances. And believe it or not, in 1914, they had separate entrances for boys and girls and separate cloakrooms. And I don't know, I guess they <coughs> probably had separate places to work outside. And outhouses. Outhouses, <laughs> there you go. Um, and of course, this is it today. The, 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 the structure has been maintained, which is kind of neat. That, and the school department just put a lot of money into new windows and everything there. So I guess we're going to keep that one for a while. This is one of my favorites. This is taken just about in front of the fire station, looking down the hill. And these houses are still there. And, and the, see the lines over here? That's, that's the trolley lines. Because the trolley, the Newport and Fall River Street Railway Company, uh, came down this bank. You know, as you go down that hill, there's a wide bank there uh, that's open space. And uh, that's where the trolley ran. And it ran from, um, well, it's essentially it ran from Newport. It, there were two lines that came out of Newport. One went the west, one went the east main road. The one east main road came out along the east main road to Park Avenue, down Park Avenue, and um, across the stone bridge to Tiverton. And then you could transfer. Uh, the trolley age, trolley era, was 1898 until 1925. In 1925, <coughs> the trolleys went out of business because the owner of the trolley line, William Vanderbilt, decided that buses were more economical and buses could go you know, elsewhere. They didn't have to stay on a track. And so with buses and what were called jitneys, which were small buses, and cars, which were becoming much more uh, obvious, uh, they had to uh, um, close down the trolley line. And they had the last run of the trolleys and things like that. <coughs> I've done a lot of research on the trolleys. And I think that might be my next lecture, by the way. Uh, but the, uh, you could take a trolley from, um, from the Fifth Ward in Newport. And you have to make a few transfers. But you could eventually get to Nashua, New Hampshire. Okay. It took four and a half hours, uh, according to the guide that I have. Um, and in, on the island here, it was five cents a town. <laughs> and look at that. I, can you imagine somebody actually, I don't know if they're walking or riding up the hill there. God. And of course, here's the scene today when I almost got my, put my life at risk trying to take this picture. <laughs> I actually had to walk across the street from the fire station. That was really kind of hairy. But what I did on these pictures, most of the modern pictures, I went out on a Sunday morning when it wasn't really too, too busy. Try to get away from the construction crews and things like that. OK, this is a sad story, very sad story. <clears throat> John F. Chase was a state rep. <clears throat> he also was a farmer. And he had a farm at the foot of Quaker Hill. And this was his house. And this is him, right here. Um, that house is somewhat disintegrated, as you probably all know. And this is what it looks like now. Very sad. Um, what happened about, uh, and it must be about 20 years ago now, a, a fellow came along and bought this house and the land behind it and was going to make a shopping center there. And for whatever, he fixed up this house, not to livable conditions, but pretty close. And then uh, whatever, whether he ran out of money or the idea didn't catch on or whatever, he also moved a house, Dr. Green's house, which is a house to the right of this, um, and moved that out into the middle of the field someplace, which, where it was vandalized and burned down eventually. Uh, but, uh, and so that whole effort collapsed. And so we never got our shopping center there. And that would have, that would have pres preserved this house. And the story I've heard, and again, you hear a lot of stories when you're the town historian. Uh, is that he just decided it wasn't worth fixing up this house anymore. And, and I, I, I fully believe that it's not worth fixing up anymore. It's too far gone. Although I've been told that underneath the clapboards, this is a stone ender house. I don't know if that's absolutely true or not. But the, um, the house dates from about, about the 1860s or so. OK, so can, make sure you can see the screen from over there. And there's seats up here. Come on up here. Anyway, OK, next one. Main Road, Portsmouth. This is taken from in front of St. Paul's Church. Okay, 
You can see the Masonic Hall over here. You can see um, uh, Vesper Lane, which comes up the hill here. You can't quite see it, but uh, there's a uh, uh, Chase, Chase and Chase store right about in here, which was next to the Methodist Church, which has been torn down. It's moved. I'm not sure exactly where it is. Anyway, and then the Methodist Church here. Um, so it's right across the street from the library. And that was, that, again, that photograph was probably taken somewhere around 1908, 1909. And here's the scene today with our brand new road going through there. <laughs> again, you still see what was the Masonic Hall here. And I guess there's a, the library has expanded so much it's, it's in the picture now. But, and, and the Methodist Church there. The, the street scene along here, I'm going to refer to this in a couple more slides. The street scene along here, you'll see a couple other pictures of, of that area. Uh, Bernie's dry goods and things like that. I know <coughs> you know where that is. The library was built in 1898 for a cost of $2,363.19. The land for the library is given by a man by the name of John Borden. Uh, who was on the library board for about 35 years. He died about 1933. And I've done some research on him, and, and his will was 38 pages long. He was a very well-to-do man. His house was across the street, a little further uh, north of here, on the right-hand side, that big white house is there. That was his house that John Borden now owns, that the descendant of his. And there's the library now. And I, I thought I'd take it before the leaves all fell. They did preserve the, the arch and so on in the front, and, uh, which is great. George A. Wyatt's Variety Store. This was taken about 1910. This is a postcard. Why they made a postcard out of this, I'm not sure. But anyway, the Variety Store, and it says on the sign, you can't read it, but over the doorway, it says, Bleach Five Cents. Okay. That, that building still stands. And, and if you look at that building, that's a false front, you know, it's like a western town or something. Yeah. Uh, you, got the, you got the roof behind, you can see that. And this isn't exactly the same angle, but, but this is the store right here. Right next to what was Bernie's Dry Goods and then was uh, the real estate agency. Still there. Took away the false front, though. Another sad story, I'm afraid. Uh, a, it was a tinsmith's house. Uh, it was called for a long time the 1750 house. Carol Zinno had it for a long time and ran an antique, an antique and gift shop there. And it's right on the corner of Dexter Street. You actually can read the Dexter Street sign right here. Um, and uh, it was run as a tinsmith shop uh, back in, in the early 20th century. Um, and unfortunately, it's you can't see it very well there, but it's really hard to see because it was, it's really taken a beating. Uh, it, is, it is in Carlos Flores, by the way. That's up the street. But it's, uh, I'm not sure what it's used for now. I guess it's a house. Just a house. But it it's, needs work. This is really an unusual one. Fort Butts is up above the high school. And Fort Butts was a Revolutionary War fort that was um, established, built by the British in defending the Quidnick Island once the British occupied the island. And they came here in, in uh, 1776 and stayed here until 1779. And the British built this fort as the high prominent point that it is. From, and, and they have the, the, the uh, uh, you, can, you can see the fort in, in the photograph. And the um, British eventually, when the Americans came on the island from Tiverton, the British evacuated this fort and moved further south. They moved down in the area of uh, the, um, the valley behind uh, Shaw's Market. OK, how about that? Uh, and the Americans followed them down. But meanwhile, the Americans occupied Fort Butts. It had a pretty substantial barracks in it. They could, it, it slept a couple hundred troops. And it, again, it was a very prominent point. Well, this picture was taken about 1908 or 1909. The, the views from there must have been spectacular. They aren't anymore, <laughs> unfortunately, because now you can't even see it from the East Main Road. This picture is taken from the East Main Road in front of the, uh, what's now the uh, Newport 
telephone company, the red brick building there, and uh, it's kind of gotten lost up there. There are some efforts to um, restore it. Uh, there's uh, Kathy Abbas has been trying to raise some money for it in order to put it back on the map. Um, a, a very sad story. There's a monument in there, a, a marble marker, that has, for the last, oh, I don't know, 10 years has been laying on its back. And through the efforts of a, of a student at Portsmouth High School for a senior project last year, he got somehow convinced the Public Works Department to put it back up. And it went back up, and it is still back up, but then it got vandalized by students, no. spray painted. No. Uh, it's a really sad story. <coughs> but it's still there, and you can still see it. And you can still go into Fort Butts. There's no, nobody's living there. Uh, and you get a sense of it, but it's just so overgrown now uh, with trees and everything. You, you can't see, well, you can't see Island Park from there, which you should be able to if, if there were. I mean, of the vista that they had from there over the whole north end of the island was really pretty spectacular. Uh, there's a windmill up there right next to it, by the way, right now, as you probably know. And, uh, and one of the interesting things about Fort Butts is that, and, and I did some research on the Portsmouth coal mine, and the coal mine was all over the place. The, the main shafts were where the Carnegie Abbey Tower is, that's the south shaft, and the north shaft was up on Baker Road. But the coal was all over the north end of the island. And, and the point I'm trying to make here is that if you go up to Fort Butts and you look down at the soil, it's not soil, uh, it's graphite. And, and you can see that, that the coal mine, and the coal mine went all the way over to Basin Street and went behind you know, the gas station over there. And uh, the, uh, the coal, there were three different entrances to the coal mine. And, so, and, and the coal mine, by the way, went down 1,800 feet. Okay. Went out under the bay, under the water, I mean below the water, below the water line, and uh, almost about halfway to Prudence. And then it went almost all the way up to Turkey Hill, where the trash compactor is. Okay. It was very widespread. And I have a map that, that someone drew for me of what the uh, mine looked like. And, and they, the shafts were connected, by the way. The north and south shafts were connected by what was called the Bull Run. And uh, lots of stories about the coal mine. That's another lecture. I won't get into that. But anyway, so but the coal mine did go all the way up to Butts Hill. And uh, by the way, if anybody's curious, there was a man by the name of Enoch Butts who lived in that area in the, oh boy. I designed the, the marker up there. And I, now I'm trying to remember. I think it was like 1674, somewhere around there. And he put a windmill uh, up there. And so that's why it's called Butts Hill. Anyway, so we can't see much of that. You can get up there if you go up um, uh, Sprague Street and take one of those streets up the hill. Uh, you can walk into Fort Butts. High school kids found it's a great place to hang out. Anyway, 1938, we had a hurricane in this town. Most of you know that. That, too, is another lecture that I do. Um, and the 38 hurricane was, was a disaster for this area. Island Park, in particular, got really blasted. The, uh, I've talked to some people who were there and saw it. Uh, and uh, what, what happened was that a 12-foot wall of water came up the Sakonet River, also Narragansett Bay, by the way. And when it got to, the, to Island Park, where there was a, a, still a functioning amusement park there, uh, right there where the, what the 501 restaurant is, right in that area, and uh, a 12-foot wall of water hit that uninhibited. And some of the houses on Park Avenue ended up over on the Montauk Golf Course. Mm -hmm. okay. 18 people died in Island Park during that 38 hurricane. Um, one family was in Common Fence Point was concerned because the water was rising. So they, they got up on the roof of their house to save themselves. Well, the roof broke off of the house and floated out in the Narragansett Bay, uh, where they came fairly close to a Navy ship that was riding out the hurricane out there, and the sailors rescued the three people that were on it. <laughs> Quite an adventure. But at the same time, the same storm over in, the, in, in Westerly, people were, were 
blown from their houses and held on to whatever they could and ended up in Connecticut someplace. <laughs> so that was really a tough storm. Well, so this is Park Avenue. Uh, and as you can see, the, the damage that was done there. And uh, the store, this 5 and 10 right here, was recently uh, redone. That's it right there. And this is, is Bob here? Bob? No, it's not. OK. Anyway, this is uh, Bob Hamilton's former business. So that, that was on that location. <clears throat> Stone bridges. We had a lot of bridges in this area. Going back to the, the first one, it was in 1795. They built a wooden bridge across there. And then, they, then six months later, they started building another one across there because that one washed out. Then in 1798, they built another one there, all wooden bridges. And none of them could, could take care of that, that wicked tide that runs through there, still does. Okay. So anyway, eventually in the, the 19th century and early 20th century, they started build, building stone and uh, metal bridges, steel bridges. And this was one of them. Um, the bridge itself was a, what called a double lift roller bridge. It would open up in the middle. There was a, a man maintaining it in a little cabin up above. And even if a sailboat wanted to go through there, he had to open the bridge. Keep in mind that, that until 1929, this was the only bridge off the island, the only bridge. We had ferries at other locations. This was the only bridge until the Mount Hope Bridge was built and completed in 1929. Anyway, the stone bridge and, and the last modification of it was in 1912. This is the 1908 uh, stone bridge. Now, as you know, the piers are still there, what's left of them on our side. This is another view of it, by the way. Not much traffic going off the island here. In this thing. Uh, anyway, another, ver uh, and you can see the uh, uh, Stone Bridge Inn over here, that some of us remember. And then this is the scene today. The town, this, the town of Tiverton has restored their side and done a really outstanding job of it. It really looks nice. I'm um, not sure, I guess they got grants for it or something. Uh, the Portsmouth side, you can't go through the chain link fence on this end, which is too bad because it really, and, and the thing at Tiverton is going to be mainly a fishing pier, and it's really outstanding for that. Uh, take a look at it sometime and see the difference and, and see what we can do about getting this side restored too. But that's about all that's left of it. This is taken right from behind 15-point uh, road down there. Sprague Street. Most of you know where Sprague Street is. Again, down in the vicinity of, of uh, the New England Telephone building there. And this is looking up the hill on Sprague. And you can see a couple of houses on the left that are still there. Marge's house is there, right? Where is she? Uh, and going up the hill uh, that way. A dirt road, as you can see. Uh, the, the main roads were paved somewhere around 19, in the early 1920s, except for Union Street. Union Street was paved earlier because Alfred Gwyn Vanderbilt decided he wanted Union Street paved, and he paid for it. So uh, that was in right around, that was probably about 19, uh, he died in 1914, so it was probably about 1912 or so. And George Thurston has told me that that was called Potter's Way at one point. It was the first cross island road, though, that was built. OK, so here's Sprague Street today. You can still see the same house, some of the same houses, going up to the uh, Masonic Temple there. Okay. Turnpike Road. It really was a turnpike. You had to pay a toll. Uh, to go on Turnpike Road from around 1840 to 1880. You had to pay a toll on that end of it. That's why, it was, that's why it's called Turnpike. And at this end, this is right where uh, Freeborn Street comes into it over here. And you had these houses over here. Oh, now I can't remember the name of the men, but they were, they were fishermen uh, in Portsmouth. The family owned those houses along there. The, the one on the right has sadly been torn down. They're, they're really nice early Victorian houses. The rest of them are still there, but it's the, uh, the me medical center there. When they expanded that a couple years ago, they tore one down. 
don't tell the state about being a toll road. Right. Pardon? <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. Uh, yeah, it really was, it, there was a, a turnstile and there was a keeper and you had to pay a toll. Not on Bristol Ferry Road, of course that's, once you get to West Main Road, it's Bristol Ferry Road, but the, it was a turnpike and owned by a man who lived right around the corner down on, on uh, East Main Road, right across from where Clements is now. Willowbrook. Willowbrook was a hotel, a summer resort, uh, and, and at one point it was owned by a woman by the name of Sarah Eddy. Sarah Eddy was a very important person in Portsmouth's history. Uh, I helped install her into the Rhode Island Heritage Hall of Fame about a year ago. And she was an artist. She was a, an animal rescuer. She was a sculptor. She was unbelievable. And she was a, a, uh, an advocate of women's right, the women getting the right to vote. Uh, she was very active in all of that. She, didn't, she died in 1945. And so she was around a long time. She was a, uh, uh, never got married. She had a, uh, a, an organization called the Social Studio where children went to learn the social graces and do maypoles and things like that. They learned art, they performed plays, and so on. That was on Bristol Ferry Road um, further down. Her home on Bristol Ferry is right before you get to the, the Mount Hope Bridge on the right. You'll, be very much aware of it as you drive by because there's been massive restoration of that house going on. And, and the fellow who's doing it, I've talked to him, is going to put more condominiums behind it. Um, but uh, but it's, it's a very, she was a very special person in Portsmouth's history. She came down from Boston as a young girl. And she was involved. She, she did a portrait of um, uh, uh, Sarah B. Anthony. And she did a portrait of Oh, my. Frederick Douglass. Hmm? Frederick Douglass. Yes, Frederick Douglass, uh, which was very important to him. He was a very important person. For a while in the women's <coughs> rights movement, then he got disillusioned with that and got more into civil rights. He was a, an escaped slave uh, from back before the Civil War time. Anyway, Willowbrook, and, and if you go into the funeral home over there, there's a, there is a, a triptych of, of three different uh, parts of a brochure. I found that somewhere. I made copies of it for them. And uh, it talks about you know, the, the wafting breezes of summer and spending your time there and things like that. Anyway, we all know what it is now, a funeral home. The Union Meeting House. The Union Meeting House, which is the Portsmouth Historical Society today. We've got to get this one in here. Uh, Built in 1865, it was called the, the Christian Union Church. It was called the Union Meeting House. It had various names. And the uh, purpose of it, the attraction of it, was to invite people to come in for, from different religious ideas. It was not really a, there wasn't a, uh, uh, what did I say, a catechism, if you will, or there wasn't rules that you had to obey to be a member. But it flourished. It, it was started in 1837, somewhere around there, 1835, 1837. They built a church on that spot. And um, in 1865, they decided to enlarge it. And they moved the previous church uh, down East Main Road to the corner of Sandy Point and East Main on the uh, south side where the condominiums are there, the Glen Acres condominiums. And if you really want to see what the original church looked like, you have to come to the Historical Society because we have a picture of it uh, that I found and a newspaper article about it, uh, which talked about how it been, had been converted after it was moved. It was converted into a barn. And you can still see the remains of the church, and the, uh, but with a big ramp in the front where there's a barn. It still had the cupola on the top with the bell tower. And uh, uh, it was, uh, it was picture I was taken about 1906, 1907, and it was in pretty sad condition. Anyway, the inside of this church uh, was, uh, let me back up, the church was given to the Portsmouth Historical Society in 1938, and the Portsmouth Historical Society really came into being in 1939. The um, um, stimulation for that 
was the 300th anniversary of Rhode Island in 1936. 1936, there were all kinds of celebrations that went on throughout the state and markers that were put out about historic sites and so on. <clears throat> and we had a big ceremony in 1936 at um, um, Founders Brook. And <laughs> I should have said something at the beginning. Uh, but I turned it off. My apologies. At Founders Brook, they had uh, this big ceremony, when, and, and the governor of Rhode Island was there, who was William Vanderbilt, and uh, a lot of other people were there. They had great ceremonies around the pudding stone that's down there. And if you ever want to take a walk into a nice park, drive down to Founders Brook. It's really it's been fixed up a lot in the 350th. 375th anniversary a couple of years ago why we got some new markers down there and it's really a delightful place. Um, when he was here visiting we took the Lord Mayor of Portsmouth UK down there. He thought it was very exciting <clears throat> to jump up on the rock and walk around and so on. It, it <laughs> has the compact on it which is the founding document of Portsmouth from 1638 and uh, uh, I have some great pictures on my computer from of the Lord Mayor with all his girth uh, standing on top of the stone. And, and he, he kept referring to us as the rebels, though. <laughs> uh, anyway, the Union Meeting House then was, was built in 1865. It's in pretty good shape. <clears throat> we had it painted over the last year, and we are in the process of having some soffit repairs going on right now. You'll see staging all around it. Uh, but it's, uh, it's been well preserved, and uh, we're very proud of it as the, the center of our historical society. It, it, we open it as a museum in the summer uh, from Memorial Day to, uh, in, into October to Columbus Day, and uh, we really encourage you to come on a Sunday afternoon and take a look at it. We have really, our curators put together a really great display there, uh, and it's an annual display. We change it every year. There's quite a substantial amount of archives in that building. So the church sanctuary itself was done over in 1996, 97. We got a grant, a huge grant, uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars to do the church structure over. And this is what it looked like last week. Okay, it's really nice. Uh, we had a contractor who did most of the work himself, including painting the Lord's Prayer over the, the back there, including, and this, this blows my mind, doing the ceiling, which is a tin ceiling, and he painted that by hand. Wow. He must have really gotten dizzy doing that, I'll tell you, it's up there. Uh, anyway, that's what the sanctuary looks like now. It's a great meeting hall. We're working on handicap accessibility, and, but we do have some lectures there during the year, and uh, it's been, as you can see, very well preserved. Back to the roads. This is East Main Road, looking from just about, uh, best I can tell, probably in front of St. Anthony's, looking south. I mean, here you see the Wyatt's Variety Store again. Whoops, wrong button. Here, too many things in my hand. The Wise Variety Store is here, and these houses are along here, and you can see St. Paul's uh, in the distance down there. Wasn't easy taking this picture again, because you can imagine, I mean, look at that, not one car, truck, whatever, <laughs> nothing on the road. One of the things that is there's a wagon down here, which is a Chase uh, Company wagon that they, it was a meat market, and they had their wagon that they did. And again, most of these houses are, are still there at the right button here. That's what it looks like today. Again, you can see the houses on the left-hand side are all pretty much still there. Bristol Ferry. This building was a steamboat wharf. It was a place where they stored goods to be shipped on the steamboats. The first steamboat in the bay was the, the Firefly, which came here about 1841. And that spawned a massive growth of the steamboat industry between then and about, uh, well, actually into the 20th century. The wharf at Bristol Ferry was a, a multi-purpose wharf. Some of the steamboats went from Providence to Fall River, and they would stop here on the way. Some of them went from Providence to Seconic Point. They would stop here along the way. 
and back and forth. The, the important thing about Bristol Ferry is that um, all forms of transportation came together there. The first ferry to Bristol was about 1640, not long after Portsmouth was founded. Uh, and the, the, there were ferries there until the building of the Mount Hope Bridge in 1929. And there's one classic photograph taken from the Mount Hope Bridge looking down at the last run of the Bristol Ferry as it went uh, underneath. The, uh, it started out as, I'm sure, a rowboat, a sailboat. They had a horse boat. They actually, there's a drawing of this. I, I have it, but I, it's not in the slideshow. But a horse boat where they had two horses walking a treadmill that powered the boat across the bay. I'm not sure it was very efficient, but anyway, that was in the 1840s. But not only did the steamboats and the ferries come here, but the railroad came here once the railroad was built in between 1862 and 1864. And there was a railroad stop there. The Bristol Ferry Stop was a pretty substantial building. And, uh, and it was there until not that long ago, probably 20, 25 years ago or so. So you had the railroads, you had the steamboats, you had the ferries, and you had the trolley line. And the trolley line came out to Bristol Ferry, and the trolley company was owned by the same people who owned the Bristol Ferry. And so you could take a, uh, a trip on the trolley out the West Main Road and uh, Turn Turnpike Avenue, Freeborn Street, Turnpike Avenue, Bristol Ferry Road, you turn off at Ferry Road, which is down there, and that would take you over to a spot that today is underneath the Mount Hope Bridge. And if you ever can get down there, take a look. Under the Mount Hope Bridge, there are all these pilings still sticking up because they had a, they had a wharf there. That's where the ferry came in. It didn't come in here. This was a steamboat wharf. Okay. And the Bristol Ferry came in at that point. And um, so you had all this transportation all together. And, and the farmers of Portsmouth, and Portsmouth was a farming town, uh, the, the population of Portsmouth at the, end, at the beginning of World War II was about 3,500. Okay, it's 17.8 now. Okay. But there were a lot of farmers, and they would take all their produce there and ship it one, one method or another to Providence or to Fall River or wherever, in some cases to New York. We also had, of course, beginning in the 1840s, we had the Fall River Line that went from Fall River to Newport to uh, New York. And the Fall River Line has a great deal of, of uh, interest uh, in it. There's, uh, I think it's still there. The Fall River Maritime Museum in Fall River is, uh, is a great location for learning about the Fall River steamboats. And they were really. And the, one of the books that's written about is called The Floating Palaces, and, and they were. But the, what a lot of people don't understand is that it wasn't just a tourist thing. They hauled a lot of freight uh, from, uh, from Fall River, from Newport, to New York and back. And they were freight long. Anyway, this, this was the ferry wharf, uh, the steamboat wharf, rather, at Bristol Ferry. This is another view of it. It wasn't kept up very well, as you can see. But this one is also at a time when the Mount Hope Bridge was being built. You can see it in the background. Now, what's important about the building of the Mount Hope Bridge <coughs> is that you can see the cables are strung. And they, had the, they do that first on this bridge. And this bridge was world renowned when it was built. It really was something very special. And so they, what they do is they hang drops down from the cable, and then they attach the uh, decking to that. Well, they got it about halfway decked, and they realized that the cables were fraying. So they had to lower all of the decking on the barges and start over with a new form of, of cable uh, cabling. And by the way, this wasn't a Rhode Island operation. This is a private operation. This was built by a bunch of investors. Okay, and, and it was opened in 1929. I think it's October 24th, 1929, when it, went, when it was opened. And there were times over, over the next 100 years, 80 years or so, where the toll across the, the, for a car was like a hundred, was a dollar, a dollar, was like about $25, $30 to get across. 
not the 10 cents that we remember and, and the free that we have now. Anyway, that's when the bridge was being built in 19, well, probably 1928 or 29. And the next one, I'm sure a lot of you remember, this is another view of the Mount Hope Marina restaurant. Owned, the last owner being Charlie Crouch, and uh, I spent many dinners in that place. It was a great, great spot. Unfortunately, today, <laughs> nothing's there. There is a committee, and Doug Smith's on it. Where is Doug? Uh, to do something with the wharf at Bristol Ferry. We had a, an attempt a few years ago by an individual, and, and, and what he wanted to do was build condos on that wharf. And where he got into trouble was that he had to pump the sewage up the hill, which doesn't work very well, usually. And so that plan uh, fell apart. And uh, there is a committee, though, that is still at work trying to decide how to make it into a park. And of course, the big problem is the big problem is not financing is the big problem, but there's a bigger problem, and that's the seawall, which is in, in pretty ragged shape on the outer edge. That's why it's fenced off. But that would make a wonderful park down there. But anyway, that's what it looks like a couple weeks, well, last week, week before last. Okay, Child Street. Child Street goes uh, down the hill from uh, near Sprague Street down there. And again, an old, old time street, dirt road, looking down toward the Sakonet River. And Child Street is, is still there. It's a little more modern today, but some of the houses are still there. Some of the same houses are still there. The Portsmouth Grange Hall. County Fair was really big. As I said, we had nothing but farmers in this town for a long time. And the, the uh, County Fair was held there between 1898 and 1938. No, that's a, that's a misprint. 1933. And at the County Fair, and they had a fairgrounds up behind, uh, in addition to the Grange Hall. Grange was really big. I have a picture of the Portsmouth Grange in, in the 1930s. And, and there, there are probably 100 people in the picture. And the Grange was really big. Um, anyway, they had the, the fair there, and they had a, 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 a track uh, up on top of the hill, and they had horse shows, and, and they had uh, samples of, of produce and so on. And, and some of the people, I, I know at Glen Farm, some of the people there would uh, grow their uh, carrots in sifted soil so that they wouldn't bend. They'd be nice and straight and smooth for the competition for the county fair. And uh, it was really a big thing and, and really big. And the building behind here that is still there, it's a construction company's place now for the most part. There are a couple things in there. Um, was a roller rink for a long time, uh, ice, a roller skating rink. My wife remembers coming out from Newport to go roller skating in Portsmouth. Um, I remember going roller skating, but not here. I, I, was, not, I was not born here. Okay. I have to admit that every time. I've had people say, well, how can you write art history if you weren't born here? <laughs> Research, it's called. Anyway, that, that was part of that. And this guy wouldn't stand still over here in the picture. He had the blur in the camera. These, these, the photography of this era, and again, this is 1908, 1910. Uh, in a lot of cases was a matter of, you know, when you take a, well, we, we don't even know, because when you took pictures 10 years ago, okay, you, you'd take a picture at, at 1 60th of a second or 1 250th of a second, something like that. With, I don't know what we get on our, si our cell phones. But in, in the early 20th century, and especially in the 19th century, back in the Civil War days, the, the amount of time that you exposed your film was a count. You would take the lens cover off and count three or four seconds and then put it back on. And, and that's how you, your expo that was your exposure. Well, what happens, as you can see in this picture, it's a good example of it. The guy standing here, this probably was a, a two or three second exposure. Well, he moved, probably sneezed or something. So he's blurred in the picture. So that's why the, the pictures back then, and even Civil War stuff, there are no pictures of essentially, and I'm a Civil War scholar. That's, I went to Gettysburg College, OK? And, and the Civil War is really big in my background. There are no pictures of action, because the movement was so hard to capture with the, the cameras that they had 
uh, back in those days, those days, which were very primitive, obviously, uh, by any kind of modern standards. But I, I really feel, and I was a professional photographer for 25 years, and, and I think I get better pictures with my cell phone than I got with my Bronicas and, and, and Hasselblads, frankly. Uh, you can't get the huge enlargements, but they're really good pictures. Anyway, that's just a little bit of photography history. here. Here's the Grange Hall today and building up behind. That was restored, by the way, uh, largely through the efforts of Mike Corcoran. Uh, we thought he was going to put his auction barn there, which is next door, but he didn't. Uh, he just restored the building and it's, it's a, did a really nice job of restoring it. That probably dates from, let's see, the Grange goes back to about the 1880s. So that building was probably, you know, 1890, 1900 uh, when it was built. And they didn't have fire plugs back in 1900 when <laughs> the other picture was taken. Okay, another view of the coal mine. I, I'm obsessed by the coal mine. This is taken from on the hill up above what's now Portsmouth Abbey where there's a, a windmill, okay, up, up on top of that hill, looking north. Narragansett Bay is, is back here. And this is the, the uh, tipper, tipple for the uh, south shaft of the Portsmouth coal mine. And there's mining housing down here. There's still some of that down that way. But uh, anyway, that's, that's what it looked like from that angle. That's a little bit more of a close-up of it. It was quite an industrial site. I was giving a lecture at, uh, at Carnegie Abbey one time, and, and one of the people who has a house there t was complaining about the fact that in his, with his $5 million house, that when he wanted to plant his tomatoes, he had to bring in soil because it was all graphite and, and coal. So he had to fix that all up. This is the south shaft of the tipple there. Uh, this is a series of photographs that, that came, came to me and came to the library via John Pierce. And there's an interesting thing in here because it was, these pictures were taken during some kind of a festival picnic day or something. And there's a little bit of a slope here that you can't see, but this is all people's heads. <laughs> They're down over the hill behind. There are other pictures taken from the other side which show that. It's kind of weird seeing all those bonnets there. Anyway, again, as I showed at the beginning, this is what that coal mine site looks like today. It's a golf course. Okay. And, um, and now, in conclusion, we have the another building at the Portsmouth Historical Society, which at one point was the town hall. What's the date now? It's 1853? Remember? I think it is. We found an invitation to the opening of it at the town hall. I think it was around 1856. 1846? Okay. <coughs> 1846. So it was the town hall, and then later it was, it was behind the current town hall, and the, uh, then it was used as the fire department. They moved up the hill from the foot of Quaker Hill, uh, that collection of stores there at the bottom of the hill. It was in there where the uh, uh, Quidnick construction is. And they moved it up, moved it from there up the hill. And then about oh, 20 years ago or so, the town didn't need it anymore. And we got it moved to the historical society. And the reason I show this picture is because we just got a brand new roof put on it. And it really looks nice. And what's stored inside is a lot of uh, farm equipment, especially really historic farm equipment. And we also have a hearse from the 1890s there, which is really special. Uh, a lot of other stuff. A lot of our displays are in there, our, our bigger displays. We have a couple of the light posts from the Mount Hope Bridge uh, in an earlier iteration. And, and we also have on the site, we have, you, I didn't take a picture of it for this because everybody's seen that. The uh, southernmost school, and it's southernmost, not southernmost. Don't ask me why. But anyway, the, uh, it's a school that was authorized in 1717 and built in eight, 1725. And it's outfitted as a school. We have a bunch of historic desks in it. And uh, we actually got a picture of it in the uh, uh, Rhode Island Monthly Magazine two months ago, September. Uh, and. Uh, it's, it's really a, a really cool building, and it goes back again to 1725. And it was later used as a uh, tax shop on a farm at Herb Hall's farm, father's farm. And uh, <clears throat> then it was moved to this site, oh, I don't know, in the 70s sometime, 1970s, and restored. 
finally, this is the town hall on site. And as, it, as the caption says, don't ask me why the, how the town clerk's carriage ended up on the top of the town hall. What year was that? Oh, it's got to be eight, 1900, 1910, something like that, I would guess. But John Pierce has this picture in his, his book, and uh, he didn't have any explanation of it either. But it is the, the horse, and, horse carriage owned by the, uh, the uh, town clerk. But anyway, to go back, this is what the building looks like now. It's been restored. So that's pretty much <clears throat> my presentation. I'd be happy.